Yes, ma'am. It is July 26th, 2021, and you are listening to episode 35 of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. What's going on, everybody? Sam Rothstein here, acting principal clarinet of the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra and host of the Candid Clarinetist podcast. I hope everyone had a chance to check out the last released episode with Michael Wayne, associate professor of clarinet at the Eastman School of Music. He provided some great advice on what to look for when when buying a new instrument. Additionally, I just posted a YouTube video of me putting his practices to work as I tried out and purchased a new Buffet Tradition clarinet. Both of these things can be found on our website at CandidClarinetistPodcast.com. And while you're visiting our YouTube channel, please feel free to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel as it really helps with the growth and visibility of the channel. I always love to hear from the wonderful listeners, so be sure to drop a comment. I'm happy to welcome today one of our first non-clarinetist guests onto the Candid Clarinetist, Nathan Hughes. Nathan is the principal oboist of the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, and I wanted to invite him on the program today to talk about what it is like to be a musician in the Big Apple, New York City. Welcome, Nathan. Thank you, Sam. It's great to be here, and uh, I'm honored to be in this uh, in the clarinet realm. That's right. Yeah, and, and I, I the reason we were connected actually is Nathan uh, came and performed with the Indianapolis Symphony for a week. It was actually our first week back uh, since the pandemic, yeah. and sounded absolutely amazing. Uh, he's he's actually the teacher of our principal oboist who was out on maternity leave and she was um, happy to bring him in and, and have him. Uh, it was it was really an honor to have you to play with us. And I hope you enjoyed your week here. I really did. That, that was a really fun week back. And to have some live audience in the hall for once, you know, was nice. And uh, and, I, and the repertoire was really great and, and great to work with you and the other other people of the Indianapolis Symphony. Yeah, it was terrific. So uh, since most of our listeners tend to be clarinetists, they're not all, but, but a lot of them are. Uh, can you just give a brief overview of your teaching and performing career up to this point? Sure. Um, well, let's see. Um, I've been at the Met uh, now in a Juilliard teaching for, oh, it's it's a good 15 years. Um, and prior to that, I was principal oboe in the Seattle Symphony. And I also taught at the University of Washington. Um, and uh, before that, I also had a couple of uh, other jobs. I was associate principal in San Francisco for a temporary position and also um, the Savannah Symphony Orchestra as well. That's a beautiful city, Savannah. It is. Yeah, a lot of history there. I really enjoyed actually living right down in the historic area cool. and uh, a lot of great old architecture there, which I really enjoyed. Yeah, I, I, I love those old southern coastal cities. Like I, I, I don't know if you, you're familiar with the Spoleto Festival, but I was there for. Oh yeah. Yeah, I was there for a year. I just love Charleston. It was so cool. And Savannah, from what I understand, is very similar. Uh, I think so. Yeah, I, I also did that uh, same festival. Oh, and Sav- Savannah actually used to do these um, joint concerts with the Charleston Symphony as well. So we would go up to Charleston, sort of when we were doing big Mahler symphonies, we'd join forces. And um, so it was a nice, the, the cities aren't very far from each other, a couple hours driving. And um, yeah, very nice area. Very cool. So you've obviously played in both orchestra and opera. Uh, mm-hmm. And and the Met is really kind of the granddaddy of them all, to, 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 to put it one way, in terms of opera. I mean, your schedule it's amazing. I mean, how many operas do you guys do per year? I believe it was around 210 operas oh a gosh. year or two, 220 actually. We should double check those numbers. Although it's it's fluctuated a little bit uh, from year to year, but I think that's that was the number that I remember hearing for a while. Wow, yeah. and then how many of those are different productions? That has varied a little bit over the years, but um, I would say it's anywhere between 25 to 28 different operas a year. Wow. That's really unbelievable. And your schedule obviously is 
very different than than what a normal orchestra schedule you know we're all used to Tuesday through Thursday rehearse concerts Friday Saturday Sunday something similar to that right but the opera schedule I imagine is completely different because you guys have multiple productions going simultaneously so can you just like walk us through you know when you rehearse and then you know does everyone play all the operas like what is kind of the distribution and how things go yeah, it's very different from most symphony orchestras, and it's a rather complex um, schedule in a lot of ways. But in a nutshell, um, what I would say is that so in any given week, the Met plays up to seven performances. It's not always seven, but very often seven. Two on Saturday. Uh, and it used to be every evening, Monday through, um, Monday through Friday. Um, that, that's changing now. We have some Sunday performances coming our way, things like that. But generally, that was kind of the idea, seven operas a week. And of those seven performances, there are probably three to four different operas being performed. And in addition to that, there are usually rehearsals during the days, um, and it could be anywhere perhaps from three to five rehearsals going on. And I would say the rehearsals are generally covering maybe two other operas. That would be sort of the average. So in any given week, there's quite a bit of repertoire going on in the house. You've got two being rehearsed, and you've got three or four different ones being performed. Um so that's part of the puzzle. Then the other part of the puzzle is what the individual musicians play, what they're scheduled for. And that's um, an interesting sort of rotation. Um, so contractually, the musicians are required to play four performances a week. And so of those seven performances, everybody will be in four one way or another. And um, very often, many musicians play additional um, operas or performances at additional pay. Sort of that's overtime when people do that. That's mostly, I would say, in the string sections when they need more players. But um, so then who rehearses what, when, and <laughs> who performs what and when um, is is sort of decided amongst the sections uh in the winds it very actually it varies quite a bit from the strings to the winds but um for instance in in the, the principal wind players um essentially split the whole the whole season with rehearsals and performances and there's a whole list of operas of the 25 to 28 that we do every year there, I, it's maybe half of them, something like that, that are considered what we say uh, switchable operas. Those are operas where both principals will play at some point during the run of the opera. And so we'll, we'll both rehearse it. Um, I'll, I'll take one or two rehearsals. My colleague will take one or two rehearsals, something like that. And then we, we do different performances based on what works out in our schedule. Um, and then there's a whole list of operas, which are the non-switching. And those operas um, are ones where the same people play from the first rehearsal through the last performance of that run. And um, that's determined um, by the management of what operas are on the switching list, which ones aren't. And it depends a lot on the repertoire, um, how challenging the repertoire is, um, how frequently we see the repertoire, um, and very often who is conducting, um, if it's a new production, you know, all sorts of things factor into what goes on what list. Uh, but the the operas that end up being on the switching list are very common operas, you know, very, very things we're, we know very well. We play them, I don't know, every other year sometimes or every third year they come up frequently. And so those operas don't usually get very much rehearsal 
Sure. We're short on space and we're at, at the mat and we're short on time also. So it's really hard to schedule enough rehearsals for everything. So, um, you know, your La Boems, Traviata, things like that, that the Met plays on a regular basis, they might get only two rehearsals. And if it's an opera that's switching, which those usually are, it means, you know, one principal will play one rehearsal and the other principal will play the other rehearsal. So you get one rehearsal and one principal might play it for a month or two. And then the other person might come in two months down the road. Those, those switching operas sometimes go on throughout the whole season. Mm -hmm. So they get scheduled, you know, once or twice a week for a few weeks. Sometimes there's a break and then they come back for a few, you know, weeks and then there's another break. Uh, so those, it's very interesting because you might rehearse it in, you know, September, October. I might not play it until April. Right. I, I get my, I get my one, one rehearsal back in September and then I show up in April and I play it and the people I rehearsed with might not be the same people that I perform it with, right. including the cast. They rotate cast too. So the cast comes in sometimes midstream and totally changes, but all the wins, you know, the, the, all the principal wins will be rotating based on their own scheduled conveniences. And so we might not always line up. So I might rehearse it with three, three people from the principal win section, you know, and then I get to the performance later and it's the other three principals that I'm playing with. Right. And the conductor so, too, right? Sometimes the conductor yeah. changes quite often. Yeah. So it's it's a very, very different schedule than than most symphony orchestras in that regard. And it it's um it's a shock to the system when you first get to the Met, I think, for most people. Yeah, I think it's, my one one follow up question I had for you is yeah. is how long before you felt like settled? You know, maybe you've played maybe you play the Carmens and the Magic Flutes and the Traviat. So like those, okay, fine. And then eventually you get a Philip Glass opera. Okay, that's the one that I need to... You know. So like how long did it take you personally before you really yeah. felt comfortable with that kind of schedule? So, you know, most musicians, I think, don't get very much experience with opera in our training in, in school. So, um, I mean, I had played... I didn't count, but probably a handful of operas before I got to the Met. I um, I was playing in Seattle. We we are also part of the Seattle Opera, so I think there were something like five productions a year there. Um, so I had some of those under my belt, and I also spent a summer uh, at the Santa Fe Opera, which I think was another five operas, perhaps. Um, so for my few years in Seattle and that, it added up, you know, to a to a handful of operas that I already knew, which really did help. Sure. Um, that that first season in particular at the Met is overwhelming. The amount of music that's that you have to learn and and to have it all in your mind at the same time because you're playing right. so many different operas at the same time and they're long, so it's it's just a lot of material to remember, you know, and and keep organized. So um, I would say for me, every year was easier than the previous one always. So yeah. there was, you know, because they would start repeating operas, but it usually the first two years were almost all unique operas. I don't think they really repeat things usually the very next year. So. Um, so the first two years are both tricky, you know, both very challenging. And, um, and then finally the third year you start seeing a few repeats and that gives you a little relief like, oh, okay, I yeah. know this one and now I can concentrate on the other ones. And then by the third, the fourth year as well, you start seeing repeats. So, you know, certainly by the fifth year, then things, you know, it's not quite, as intense as it is the first two years. But I, I think everybody that gets them to the Met is just in shock for, oh, for a sure. couple of years. Absolutely in shock. The, it's the repertoire. It's the length of the rehearsals and the performances. They're both very long. And, um, you know, the season is very compact. Like we, we don't get um, – well, we get one floating vacation week. We don't get a lot of breaks during this time from September through May. So, um, 
you know, usually in symphony orchestras, you know, there'll be a week off for the whole orchestra, you know, every four to eight weeks or something, there'll be something off and, um, everyone can kind of, you know, catch up on sleep and, and look <laughs> ahead at the next repertoire and, you know, catch up on life. You don't get that chance to, to come up for air at the Met. Once you get going, once the season comes, it is like a Mack truck coming your way. Yeah. And you've got to be ready <laughs> because that that is a powerful machine that is going. Uh, so it's um, yeah, it's different, no doubt. And it's such a high level. Like I, I've only seen the Met. Well, I want to say once. Definitely in my conscious mind, I've seen it once. Um, that sounded really bad, but in my adult life, I've seen it once. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, it was Don Carlo. I remember. I don't know if you were playing. Oh, it was. It was. I might have been. Uh, it was six years ago, I think, something like that. It was right before I got here. Right, right after I got in this job. Right before I moved here, and I was stunned with how good the orchestra was. I, I, I didn't. Mm. I, I didn't know how good the orchestra was, and it's just the sound that you that you, you mm-hmm. and your colleagues get is just incredible, and the blend, and it's just like I've never. Yeah. There was there was a section in Don Carlo where it was all the principal winds playing together, and it sounded like an instrument that I had never heard before. And you know, yeah. I lived in Chicago for many years, sure. like I, and and so I, it just it's incredible that you do that. And then I sit here listening to you say that oh, you have you know eight hours of rehearsal and four performances <laughs> a week. Oh, and by the way, most of us haven't even played the opera during the performance. It's just amazing to me. So I think it just speaks to the talent and the abilities of the and the caliber of the musicians that you guys have well and there's a a tradition that's been um set up there over the years and what you mentioned about the quality of sound and the blend those are two major things that attracted me to the met from the very beginning Uh, things that i've always admired about the orchestra and um and really made me want to be a part of it And I think part of that comes from the influence of um, the conductors and the music director for many years there, James Levine, and also the individuals who played there and their sets of priorities. Um, So there was a certain tradition and culture that I think was kind of established. Um, But there's also something about the nature of playing opera where, you know, the orchestra has to have a certain malleability and a certain suppleness to be able to accompany singers in a in a rewarding and productive way um where and the singers are often at a great distance and there is a lot going on on stage so there's a lot of um a lot of variables that can caused the train to go one way or another very quickly. And so I think it actually, people have had to cultivate their sound into something that will allow them to adjust quickly, allow them to maneuver, to, to go this way or go that way, depending on what's going on. So I think everybody's had to come up with a sound that works for that. And then everybody also has had to sort of develop a, a certain awareness and a certain approach to music make, making, which is very accommodating for colleagues um, because we're, we're so used to adjusting to each other all the time and adjusting to the singers. There's just, you do this in a symphony orchestra, of course, also, there's no question, but the added distance and the added elements of props on stage and the singers having to act and move around the stage creates just a lot of things that can vary from night to night. So things are probably a little less consistent in a way, still could be equally good one night to the next, but very different because of all those things. So it's, it's a very interesting, um, very interesting place. And do you find yourself, uh, just kind of taking a step back every once in a while. I know you're so focused on the music you're making, but I mean, if I were sitting there, I would just be still so inspired all the time. I mean, you're, you're literally singing or playing with the best singers in the world being conducted by the best conductors who have ever lived. And your colleagues are just, 
playing these beautiful phrases left and right, I mean, for me, it would be overwhelming in that sense as well. Yeah, there's no doubt just sitting in that pit. There's also something <clears throat> when you're playing in a pit, you, you can hear very well um, across, you know, maybe it's our acoustic also at the Met, but, um, but like, for instance, you can hear the front of the orchestra very well, the strings, you know, they're playing against kind of a wall. And so the sound, I think bounces back a little bit, which is maybe part of it. Um, we have a very nice acoustic in general, but anyway, I sometimes, I feel like I'm just bathing in this amazing sound <laughs> when I'm sitting right there in the middle of it. It's quite spectacular in, in the orchestra. And what you said about the, the singers, I mean, they really are, you know, the world's greatest singers that come through there on a regular basis. And, there, you know, singer, the voice is such an inspirational instrument, you know, naturally, just inherently speaking, but especially when it's in the hands of these amazing singers. And we'll have sometimes orchestra rehearsals with the singers down in a, in a rehearsal room, uh, because the stage will be used for something else. Like sometimes half the orchestra is upstairs rehearsing something or, or they're usually doing a piano rehearsal is what it is with the singers and they're mm -hmm. blocking the set and downstairs will be the orchestra. So when we're in a little more close proximity with the singers, I mean, it, it is stunning the yeah. power that you feel in that room. I, I mean, it, you know, it doesn't happen all the time, but on a fairly regular basis every season, I am sitting there and am just completely blown away by some singer that I hear in the back of the room, which just, they're larger than life. They, they, they take over the room. I mean, they can overpower the orchestra single-handedly. And, <laughs> and it, it's not necessarily, you know, forced and ugly. It's just they, they, some of them have these very, very big voices. And, and those are nice. And some of them have smaller voices. That's nice too. But, um, it's, you know, that is part of what makes that orchestra and that position and that company so inspirational is listening to those artists yeah, on a regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. And do you ever feel kind of like the, pressure or weight of i mean it's such a storied institution with such a, a lasting legacy like do you ever do you ever feel that and and does it or is it just kind of like you're so focused on what you're doing that you don't really have time to to think about that stuff i think mostly i would guess uh, for myself and i'm guessing for other people too that mostly it's your you're just always doing your best you know i think yep. I think this, I'm, I mean, I, I can't speak for everybody, of course, but I think for most artists, we've been pushing ourselves, you know, to be better and better and better for so many years that, um, I don't, I don't know very many musicians who are at this, at a really high level that just phone it in, you know, they're really usually trying and, and it's for their colleagues. It's for sure, certainly the respect of the institution. It's for the respect of the art form that everybody is doing this. And they've been doing it for so many years. I think that we all just push ourselves to that level. So the extra pressure of being at a, you know, a historical institution is just, uh, you know, one other little thing that's in there. Um, but we've been, I think everyone's just been so constantly trying to make sure that they're doing their absolute best that, you know, that, that takes precedent. And it's, I remember one thing, you know, soon after I got to the Met, they used to only have Saturday matinees that were, um, broadcast on the radio. And then I think it was somewhere right around where I started, where we, we started doing broadcasts, I think about four times a week. And we started getting on Sirius Radio. There was a Metropolitan Opera uh, station on Sirius Radio. I, I hope it's still there. I think it's still there. Mm -hmm. um, and that was interesting when that started because then the, you see the microphones, you know, sure. the, 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 you see the microphones four nights a week instead yeah. of just just that one afternoon. And I, you know, when that happened, I actually kind of noticed that the level maybe just ever so slightly went up. Not that the not that our A game went up. I think it was our consistency went up. 
sure. because I do think, you know, okay, maybe on a, you know, a Tuesday, Wednesday night, maybe the orchestra was slightly more relaxed or something. But when those microphones are there almost all the time, all of a sudden I noticed the consistency was, was even better. So there, yeah. that did, that probably did some good. Yeah. And I, I loved what you said. And I think too, when, if, you, if you're good enough to get to that level, I think you also do it for yourself because you just feel like it's a pride thing. You're like, I, you know, a lot of other people would like to be here. I want to do my best and just put my best foot forward every time. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, good. So I, I know the, the Met too, you guys have a, uh, fair, I guess it, it's br- a brief concert series at Carnegie Hall mm-hmm. every year. Is it three concerts? Is that right? Is that what it usually is? Yes, that's our sort yeah. of normal number. So I've I've unfortunately not yet had the opportunity to play at Carnegie Hall, but I, what is that like? I mean, mm. is it really the Carnegie- mecca? Yeah, it's a beautiful space. It really yeah. is a beautiful acoustic, a beautiful place to play. Certainly it's it's, you know, iconic and in nature, so it feels, you know, special every time you play there. Um it's, you know, the acoustic every acoustic of every place is so different and there are pros and cons to everything and everybody has their own personal preferences and all of that. Um, Carnegie has, I would say a very warm sort of sound to it. It's a bit on the resonant side, which makes things, you know, the sound blossoms very Mm -hmm. well in there. And, uh, so I actually find that, you know, the Met for, for the way the Met plays quality of sound is a, is a, high priority, I think. And as you were mentioning, the blending capabilities and all of that, it is complemented quite well by the acoustic at Carnegie. And I, the the orchestra concerts that the Met plays at Carnegie are some of the most memorable experiences I've ever had. And I look forward to them every year. Um, It's also a chance for the orchestra to play this repertoire that we don't get to play as often. Right. Um, which is really fun, you know? And so I think everybody gets a little excited about that. And we only get one performance of these particular programs, you know, so we don't play, you know, three or four of them. So what we put out there in that one performance, everybody is going for it. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's a very, it's a great place to play. Not to mention, of course, you know, that, you know, the night before you put, just played was, you know, the Vienna Philharmonic right. and you know, the, the week before that was the Chicago symphony. And you know, three weeks before that was the Berlin Philharmonic and sure. you know, you name it, everybody comes there every year. So there's the, the there's a very high level of music making going on in that space all the time. So I think, you know, everybody's, everybody's trying to do their best when they get there. And so you really get some special performances. I love going to performances at Carnegie also. That's one of the highlights of, of you know, living in New York, really, is you get to go and, and listen to some of the world's greatest artists on a, just a regular basis. They come in there, and it's, it's such a beautiful acoustic to listen to them. Um, it's really, really enjoyable. Well, that, that was actually one thing that I wanted to ask you about is, I mean, obviously mm-hmm. you're very busy uh, September through May with the operas and, and your teaching schedule, I'm sure is, is busy as well. But do you ever take the time? I mean, you're, you're in New York City. It's, there's Broadway. There's the world's best jazz musicians. There's, I, I mean, all, I mean, there's like 5,000 orchestras there. Like, you know, I mean, it, there's all these schools with these amazing students. Uh, do, you, do you take yeah. the time to, to, to go and enjoy the culture that is there. I, I try. I mean, you're right. I mean, the Met is a very busy place. And also, I do teach a lot. So I spend a lot of time doing that. So it, it's one thing that I do wish I had more of is free time in New York to enjoy all the benefits of New York, um, which is such a unique place, especially, you know, culturally speaking. It's just such a mecca. Um, so yes, I do make time every year to do at least a handful of things, but I see so many things go by that I wish I, know, yeah. I could have gone to or enjoyed and so many, so many, it's just, it's hard to find time for everything. Um, 
yeah, New York is, it, we're, we're short on time and we're short on space. Yes. <laughs> you know, those are the two things that are a little tricky in New York City. Um, and of course, it's a very expensive city. So, you know, everybody feels short on money too, I think. Yeah. But it's, you know, it, but I think, yeah, you, you must, everyone who lives there has to take advantage of that because it's, it's a shame to not be able to go to performances and be inspired by all these different genres and things going on. It's, it's really a unique, special city in that way. Yeah, I think so. Uh, it's, it's really unlike, for those who haven't been there, it's just really unlike any other place, I've, at least in this country that I've been. It's yeah. just so, I mean, you walk... You can walk from basically any point in the city to another point in the city, and you'll pass one sushi restaurant at every block. Like you could find like a a, a, a path. It's crazy, you know. It's just like the food oh, yeah. and the culture I mean, and the sports and just it's just nuts. Everything, and that that goes back to mu to musicians as well. You know, being a musician in New York City does not feel odd. Do you know what I mean? A lot of in a lot sure, of yeah. places, I feel like if you're a musician, you're you're doing something that's very unique in that place, maybe, and not a lot of people are doing that there, and you know, it's it's just something different. But being a classical musician in New York, or being any kind of artist in New York, is kind of you know normal. There's a yeah. lot of people like that. You know, any day you walk down Broadway on the Upper West Side and you pass people carrying violins and cellos and all sorts of instruments. And it makes you feel um, like what you're doing is something that's, that's um, normal and respected. And it's, it's, you know, I think that's one thing that's very nice about being a, an, a, an artist in New York city is that you have other, a lot of other people whose goals and sort of, um, focus in life lines up with yours. And so you don't, uh, you don't feel, you know, awkward in any sense of the word. I mean, not that you would in every other place, but it is a little different, I think. Yeah. That's a lovely comment. Actually, i never really thought about that, but I have always kind of felt like a, like somebody asked me what I do. And then I, I say I'm a musician and then I have to explain to them that like, that's what I do. Whereas in New York, you're like, Oh yeah, my brother used to play in the New York Philharmonic, uh, you know, 30 years ago, yada, yada, yada. That's very normal and widely accepted. It's like being an actor in Los Angeles, right? If I said I was an actor yes. living in Indianapolis, they'd be like, what? Like, well, how do you, yeah. how do you do that? But in LA, like everyone's trying to be an actor, actor you know? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it, it really does. I think it, it affects the way you view, your life's passion you know it becomes something that is um you don't have to prove yourself you know that you've chosen this path it's not something that you have to explain to people as much although you know it's still i still feel like classical music in particular is you know not as widely i don't know um uh, revered perhaps as it is in some other countries, um, you know, in the States, but, but New York is one place where it is, um, I think respected. Yeah. That's so, a lovely, uh, comment. I love that. Yeah. I love that perspective. Uh, so you, you talk about how, uh, you know, New York is so crowded and, and, and I imagine that you don't have a short commute uh, to work. So can you sort of talk about like how that kind of figures factors in everything? Cause that's well, a whole nother thing. I actually do have a very short. Oh, good commute. for you. I, I yeah, <laughs> but I, I've never been somebody who really likes commutes. So I was rather determined in New York to, to find a way to walk to work. And Excellent. that's me, you know, that's just me. That's what I prefer. That's what I like. And you know, you give up space mostly, and money, <laughs> space and money to do that. But, um, but for many people, uh, commuting is part of New York city life. And luckily the schedule of most, um, you know, performing arts institutions is sort of opposite of the nine to five people that are commuting. 
It's a good point. You yeah. know, in in general, so you you don't get the huge backups that that if you're if you need to you know get in there by nine a.m. and you're leaving at five p.m. You know those those commute times are very long. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but you know, orchestra rehearsals at the Met start around ten thirty, so it's you miss some some of the <laughs> traffic. what nine million people there or something like that isn't it yeah, or is it eight, there's is still it, it used to be eight million and i don't know if it's nine I, now, probably yeah, there's a well actually maybe some left during the pandemic so we <laughs> might be down yeah. <laughs> it might be down now but but you know i i think the issues for commuters um um, they, they commute in different ways. Some people take the train a long distance, or some people drive to to various uh, you know different places. Um, I think the one tricky thing is that you know as musicians, we need to be on time for the starts of things. Whether it's a rehearsal or a performance, you can't allow you can't take the risk of being late. Whereas you know if you're maybe working some other jobs, there's probably a little bit of wiggle room. If you ran into a lot of traffic and you're five minutes late, eh, you know, maybe it's not that big of a deal. Five minutes late at the Met for an opera is a major deal for a musician. Um, a, A very big deal, depending on what position you're playing. But Sometimes operas are delayed because somebody has been completely stuck in traffic. I've heard a couple of stories where <laughs> there was a long opera, like a Wagner opera, which is very expensive to produce, and especially because of the long hours. And 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 somebody that was critical to the orchestra was late, and they had to delay it something like ten minutes, which sent oh, it God. into an thousands extra, of dollars. Oh, I mean, like, who knows how much money, you yeah. know, because the overtime is is for like, you know, a hundred stage hands and a hundred chorus members and a chorus, a hundred, you know, you, it's just so being on time is so important. So unfortunately, what that means for commuters is that you have to allow this enormous amount of time just in case. And that's what, you know, going home late at night from the opera, I think a lot of people might have a, say, 30-minute commute, 20-minute, you know, straight shot home, no problem. Mm -hmm. But coming in, they might have to allow an hour, an hour and 15, maybe an hour and a half, depending on where they're coming from, just in case. Yeah, well, also, like, who the hell knows what else is going on in the city? I mean, there's so many different events and all that stuff. And the other complication is is the schedule is, you know, there's usually rehearsals from something like 1030 to 2 or 230. And then the opera starts around 7 or 730. So you've got, you know, and most people like to show up a little early for an opera. So, you know, maybe you want to be there at 7 for a 730 show or something like that. And so... You have to decide if you're playing both of the, that rehearsal and that evening, which happens every week for numbers, a lot of people, you've, you've got five hours, but really it's about four and a half because you got to be back in your chair ahead of time. And you've got maybe a, th- you know, it could be a 30 or 40 minute commute home, but then you have to allow an hour and a half to get back. <laughs> so now you're driving home just so you can sit at home for maybe, you know, rest for like two hours. I don't know. I haven't done the math exactly because I have not chosen this direction yes, right. <laughs> for this for this exact reason that I'm explaining right yes. now. But so there there are many <laughs> days where a lot of my colleagues stay in the city the whole day. Mm-hmm. In fact, they do this usually multiple days a week. Many of them teach in between the rehearsal and the performance. But what it means is you leave the house, say, 9 a.m. to go for a 10.30 rehearsal. You teach or do something in the afternoon, and then you play a three- or four-hour opera that gets out at, say, 11.30 at night, and you might Mm -hmm. get home at midnight or maybe after midnight. So you just gave yourself – how many hours is that from 9 a.m. to – you know? it's a long day. Yeah. And then who knows what you got to do the next day, right? And the next day, there's a good chance you have to be at the 1030 AM rehearsal. That's another thing that we have. We have performances and rehearsals the very next morning. So this, this, all of this scheduling thing, it does, it, it has, uh, it takes a toll on people and it's, um, it's part of the adjustment process, I think, to the job when you get there. 
you have to you have to real figure out how to deal with this situation and how to deal with life in this situation and your body has to adjust to it i mean i remember my first year it was like my back was hurting from sitting for so many long hours and you know and i finally started exercising a little differently to strengthen my back just because i i am sitting a little differently also posture um because injuries happen a lot when you're playing this much a lot of people have injuries. So um, it's, it's very important to have sort of an efficient way of going at your instrument so that you're not putting undue pressure on your body. Right. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's quite a lifestyle, I think. And it just, it's, it's so unique too. I mean, I just can't keep, get over how unique, you know, I, I know a lot of opera orchestras work under like hours, like you have X amount of hours. I think the Washington National Opera does that. I'm not sure if Lyric does it. Mm-hmm. But it's just because the schedule is just so different. Uh, and then you guys, yeah. you have two orchestras, and it's just, man, just wild. I, I imagine it's probably hard to keep track of at some points. Just, Very hard. It's, yeah. it's, there, there are a lot of mistakes that happen, I would say, occasionally where people thought they were playing in one night or maybe they, they thought they weren't. That's the mistake that we notice usually right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, when they don't show up. So it's, it's a huge puzzle to keep track of for the personnel office. Oh, God, yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's just a, it's really, it's this gigantic machine that's going on there to keep all this working. Yeah. So, I think we can close with, I wanted to ask if you have any advice for mm-hmm. those wanting to live and work in New York City. I know a lot of people go to school in New York, obviously Juilliard, where you teach, Manhattan School of Music. There's a ton of great options there for music schools. And I think some people, uh, or I've, I've heard this, where they're like, I'm going to go to school in New York, and then I'm going to graduate, and I'm going to be on the sub list at the Met and the New York Philharmonic. And I, I think... You know, I, it'd be I'd appreciate it if you gave sort of a general overview of like how you can work your way up and how like what you have to do to kind of like establish yourself in New York. Sure. So I think, you know, New York is a place that you actually can be a freelance musician. Mm-hmm. That's not so possible in a lot of areas, but New York City is one place where that is possible. Um, We have many freelancers, um, many amazing musicians that are freelancers there, which also means that the, you know, there is competition, you know, the competition level among freelancers is, is significant. It's, it's quite significant. And a lot of people are very well established that have been there for many years. So they have a lot of their normal Uh, jobs and things that they play and all of that. So it's just like, you know, symphony orchestras in any uh, town where you sort of have to wait for a position to open in, in some ways it, you know, it's not exactly like that, but there's a little bit of that. I think if you have some, some dominant freelancers, um, you have to kind of wait for, for some openings to happen like that. But nonetheless, it is a city where it's possible and I do think that if you can study there a little bit, at least a master's degree or something like that, just to sort of begin growing your network and having people know you in, in one way or another is helpful. I think it's hard to come in, um, you know, not not knowing too many people just from the outside and move there and and start to work. I think it's very tricky. I think most, um, most jobs that come people's way are through personal connections. I think their recommendations, everybody trusts certain people for recommendations. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where people get traction is if, you know, somebody that has heard you play or has worked with you and likes your playing, um, speaks highly of you. And if there happens to be some situation where there's an opening of some kind, usually it's last minute where people get their first, where they first get their first experience or, or opportunity is an emergency situation uh, you know, it could be a last minute and you're called at the very last minute. So you have to be sort of available and you have to be, you know, nearby. And <laughs> there are a lot of things that come into play there. Um, but then you also have to be on the radar for hopefully somebody's somebody that would be speaking highly of the way you play. So that's just kind of 
playing with a lot of people, playing for a lot of people, just so that more people know about you and, you know, hopefully trust your playing and grow fond of you as a, as a colleague and all of that, then, you know, word spreads and, and that's kind of how it works. It's, I think it is a tricky, it's a tricky thing. Um, yeah. There's no doubt about it. I think it's very tricky, but I do think if you can study there for a couple of years, I do think that helps get the ball rolling. Yeah. And also when you're in school, you don't, you know, you're not, you don't expect to be, you know, playing a ton of jobs all the time you're studying. Right. So, you know, but you might get an occasional opportunity here and there, and then that sort of works out very well. Whereas if you move there as already a professional, a little bit older, um, you still, you might not get that many opportunities right away. So it's a bit tricky and difficult, you know, just to sustain yourself in an expensive city like New York. I mean, it's, it's not something to take lightly moving to New York. Mm -hmm. I think it's an exciting city. I think it's unique and I think it can be great. And I think it works for a lot of musicians, but it is, it is something to take very seriously because it's not, it's not super easy. Yeah. Well, terrific, Nathan. Uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I, I really just loved our week together here. I, I thought it was, it was very inspiring for me and I know for, for the rest of my colleagues. And I hope that you and I have the chance to play together again sometime. I don't know when or that might be, but uh, that'd be terrific. So thank you so yeah. much for, for joining me. Thanks again for having me. And I, I do hope we can play again soon. Absolutely. So for more information about myself and the Candid Clarinetist podcast, please be sure to follow us on Instagram at the Candid Clarinetist or drop by our website at candidclarinetistpodcast.com. Once again, my name is Sam Rothstein and thanks for tuning into the Candid Clarinetist podcast.